Let's go ahead and uh, get started here. Connie's going to be making us some more copies in case we need some. Um, um, sorry, just a second. Um, yeah, you've got a new paper. I think everybody's got one. Um, we're moving into Matthew 16 to 18, and, um, and we're just moving right along. Um, oh, it's a race. Thank you, whoever did that. Um, I didn't do it. You didn't do it? What? Whoever did it, whether it, was, whether it was Mick or not, thank you for, to whoever did that. Um, Matthew 16 to 18, this takes us uh, easily and well into the second half of the gospel morning. Um, yeah, we've got more copies coming, so um, pictures of church is what I'm entitling uh, this uh, three-chapter study, pictures of church, and you'll see uh, why as, uh, as we get going. So let me pray first, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us back here. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness towards us. Thank you for uh, the church, the means of grace that it is for us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would stir up our hearts to know uh, the real Jesus, to live in and follow him, and, uh, and ultimately stir up our hearts to love and treasure him, who to know is eternal life. Use this time, O oh Lord, to shepherd us and disciple us, and uh, may we truly be the church, uh, as we're going to study this morning. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, uh, the reason why I'm calling this Pictures of Church is because Jesus talks about the church two times uh, in all of the Gospels. Two times the word ekklesia comes up from, uh, in the Greek from Jesus' mouth. And both times uh, are in these three chapters. One time is in Matthew 16. The other time is in Matthew 18. And um, as I was kind of studying this and looking at it Thursday and Friday, it kind of just made sense to me that, that really what he's describing in all three of these chapters is how to be the church after he's gone. Um, he's beginning to prepare the disciples for his own personal uh, departure, his, uh, his leaving. And you can see that in the fact that he begins to uh, foretell the fact that he's going to go to the cross uh, he begins kind of preparing them for that, um, saying that there's going to come a time when this is going to, uh, when this is going to end, and uh, you're going to be not left alone. That's you know the point is that he's with them even after he leaves, um, but they're not going to see him like they see him now. Um, so he's giving them pictures of church uh, as he uh, as he's preparing them for that. So Matthew 16. <clears throat> 1 to 12, uh, you find there uh, the top heading there, Matthew 16, 1 to 12. Uh, yeah, Connie or Roger, uh, Fabiani needs one right up here. Um, he begins by criticizing the religious elite, criticizing the religious elite. In particular, the Pharisees, who were probably the more conservative of the bunch, the Sadducees, who are the more progressive of the bunch, we might say. And um, they come to test him. Actually, before, I, before we look at the text, let me just say this. Um, let me remind you that back in the Sermon on the Mount, you remember he had told the disciples, uh, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will never enter uh, the kingdom of heaven. And uh, we hear that oftentimes, and we think that Jesus is raising the standard and lifting it up really, really high because the Pharisees and the scribes, they were like the religious elite of the day, and they were the best of the best. But the fact is that... Here, here was a people who, in many ways and in many senses, um, really were all about protecting the status quo of the day and using religion and using tradition and all of that to protect how things were um, to the point where they weren't really listening to God anymore. They weren't really seeking to hear his voice and to, uh, to let him lead them uh, and shepherd them. And so the word for righteousness back in the Sermon on the Mount, it's a word that by it, Jesus doesn't just mean literally righteousness. He, he's referring to that which the Pharisees consider to be praiseworthy and what they consider to be what really truly pleases God. Um, and uh, so he is saying, 
your righteousness, if you want to follow me, has got to be better than theirs. Because theirs really isn't that high. It's more traditional. It's more status quo oriented. It is a lower, really only outward focused righteousness. Um, reading uh, Dallas Willard's book, uh, The Divine Conspiracy, and he, uh, he talks about that in his, uh, one of his chapters on the Sermon on the Mount, how Jesus is, is actually criticizing what they consider to be righteousness. And he's saying it's different than what God says righteousness is. So that being said, they're protecting the status quo. And then in verses 1 to 4 here of chapter 16, they come to test him and ask him to show them a sign from heaven. And he answers them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah, which is what he said back in chapter 12. Uh, Jonah spit out of the fish uh, after three days, and that's going to be it's going to typify Jesus as being spit out of the of the ground after three days. That's going to be the sign. So he left, um, so he left them and departed. Seems like Jesus's point here is again they're so focused on the status quo, they're so focused on maintaining appearances and comfort in life how it is that they can't tell the moment that they're actually in. Um, it's like they're so focused on the moment that they can't actually understand the moment. They're so focused on how things have been and how things are going that they can't, they can't tell this is the Messiah. This is the Christ that was promised. This is the fulfillment of all those promises. This is inaugurating the, uh, the end times. Um, maybe not totally consummating it as, uh, as it's going to um, be in the end, but it's certainly inaugurating it. They can't tell that uh, because they're so focused on the moment and the moment and the status quo um, that they are helping to protect. Um, and so, I guess probably the probably the pastoral point from this would be, you know, I would hope that that we would be able to ourselves not be so caught up in the moment in which we find ourselves that we don't recognize also. Um, the true time that, that we are in. Um, I think that sometimes among evangelicals when we focus so much on, oh, look at how the world is, Christ must be you know, right around the corner and coming back within the next few years or something like that. Um, it might actually be because we're so focused on the moment in which we find ourselves that we are misinterpreting it. Every, every generation has thought that they were the last generation. Every generation has thought that they were the end. One of these days, um, one of these days, after I have finished my doctoral work, I'm planning on actually uh, trying to trying to write something, a historical study on how every generation has thought that they were the end times. And I think that the real reason why um, is because you grow up, you live as a young adult, the world is generally speaking pretty positive, and things work a certain way. Life goes on, you see more and more, and you realize how messed up things are. You assume things are getting worse. It's the things were always bad. It's just that you didn't realize how bad they were until, until you get to the end. Now, is it possible that things are worse today than it was in a previous generation? Of course, it's possible. Is it possible that Jesus is going to return tomorrow? Please, Lord, please return. I'm begging you that you would. It's also possible that we are so stuck in the fact that the status quo for so long was kept and protected and now it's not, that we assume that it must be the end. And it's like, it could just be that things are changing right now and our Lord wants to test us to find out if our faith is still going to stand strong regardless of what's happening in the world around us. Um, I, I see a connection between between what's going on with the Pharisees and what's going on with us as Christians. I'm not saying that we're Pharisees, but again, they're so focused on the status quo, they can't recognize that Christ, the Christ is standing right in front of them. Um, they interpret the skies, but they can't interpret the times. And so um, my hope and my prayer would be that we would, 
we would not fall prey to the same problem where we, um, where we are so trying to protect how things are uh, that we miss perhaps what God is doing in our midst, how he's advancing his church, how he's advancing his kingdom, and how he's working in maybe different ways uh, than, than we would have thought that he was, perhaps, or maybe that we would if we were God. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later this morning. So, because they're so focused on status quo and because they trust it so much, they ask him for a sign. And Jesus says, you're not going to need a sign. Plenty of signs have already come to you, and another sign is going to come to you when I rise from the dead. But for now, that's not what you need. You need to listen to me. You need to hear my word and, uh, and go with that. Now, <clears throat> before I take a break from rambling, um, sorry, just a second. Um, before I take a moment from rambling here, uh, verses 5 to 12 shows that the disciples are also a little too over-focused on tangible things and not on spiritual matters. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O you of little faith. And by the way, just how many times does this come up through the Gospel of Matthew especially? O you of little faith. I can think of at least three. There's probably more. Um, and yet, notice that he still has fellowship with them, and he still loves them even with their little faith. O you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive, do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets you gathered, or the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So we might want to sympathize with the disciples a little bit because they were talking about bread when Jesus made this point about leaven. Um, but the fact that Jesus always was speaking deeper and was always focused on spiritual matters more than tangible matters should have tipped them off that he was talking about something else when he spoke of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, it wasn't like the Pharisees and the Sadducees had some kind of bread business on the side and the disciples got their bread from them. Um, clearly, he was talking about something else, and, um, and they, they missed it. They didn't realize it at first. Eventually, they realized it, but only after Jesus challenged them. Seems like, just like the Pharisees and Sadducees, these disciples are also focused on tangible things and not on spiritual matters that then drive everything else. Um, they're not entirely unlike the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, in this way. That's why he says it's the leaven of these, uh, of these people. Um, make sure that you're not missing, Jesus says, that if you are with me, I'm going to provide for you. Even if you're out of bread, guess what? I'm able to make bread. I've already proved it to you many times. By the way, I mentioned um, a couple of times, I think, in recent studies when Jesus feeds the 5,000 and then the, uh, the 4,000, that it's Mark who clarifies that it, that it was indeed two different times and not just one, as the Bible critics say. I forgot, actually, that Matthew mentions it here as well, that, uh, that Matthew shows that it's, it is definitely two different times, um, and both of them have a purpose and a point. But Jesus saying, beware of their teaching... He's saying their teaching only seeks to maintain status quo, and again, they cannot see what God is doing. So disciples, make sure that you don't fall prey to that same temptation. It's in you, it's in the world, it's the temptation. Um, but make sure that your eyes are spiritual. Make sure that your eyes are spiritual and not merely physical. Make sure that you are looking for what God is doing and um, feasting your attention there. And if you do, what does he say? Everything else will be provided for you. It's probably no coincidence that that same phrase, a you of little faith, was used back when Jesus makes that great teaching on anxiety and uh, seeking first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be given to you. Because despite your little faith, if you cling to me, and if your eyes are spiritual, God's going to provide for you. He will not let you go hungry. 
He will not let you miss uh, what it is that you need. So, thank you. Um, I'm still getting used to my new glasses. And um, sometimes, sometimes when I'm up like teaching or preaching or something, I'm like, do I need to switch to my other ones? It just is kind of, just a little weird. I don't know. I'm going to talk to the eye doctor about it in a couple weeks. Anyway, anyway, um, illustration uh, of the need to have spiritual eyes and not, uh, and not focus on what your physical eyes can, uh, can or can't do. Um, so, so, Matthew 16. Um, exposing... the leaven of religiosity. That's what we might call this. Exposing the leaven of religiosity. That's sort of the first part of this chapter. And uh, before I move on, because I actually think we might cover uh, all of chapter 16 today, but before I move on, uh, I want to go ahead and open it up for any comments or questions. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, this is a little section here about the stuff in which we uh, uh, understand the high road. This the whole idea is that uh, they do not have the understanding that the disciples be able to comprehend what the Lord was saying, so they open their understanding, and that's what we find in verse 12. Yeah, and that's what, um, so Peter's just making the point that, that how we read verse 12 there, then they understood, then they understood. It's not that, um, it's not that they then personally assented to something. Uh, it's that the Spirit of God was helping them to have it click so that they got it. Just like it says in Luke's gospel multiple times, he opened their minds to under, well, it says that in Luke 24, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Earlier in Luke, two different times, it says that their minds were hardened so that they could not understand. Um, and uh, then he opens their minds. So uh, Paul makes the point in 1 Corinthians 2 that, that God's given us his spirit so that we can understand the things freely given to us. So think about it like this. The spirit inspires the scriptures. The spirit inspires the teaching of the gospel. And then the Spirit gives us the ability to understand it. And so this is all, for those of us who struggle to understand the Spirit and the Spirit's work and all of that, that's, that's where we should start. The scripture is the Spirit's book, and then understanding is the Spirit's work uh, as well. So certainly something that over the course of time the Spirit had to bring them to and prepare them for. And he had. You know, it was a, when it clicked, it was a, it was a beautiful thing. Paul. How things are the same through the ages. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually this book already. Is there? Yeah. You've heard of Jerry the Democracy. Yeah. He's written a lot of books on God and the government. It's really good. And that subject, like he's also written on the madness of last things. Madness of last things. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, very, very 
Harris now. I think he's, um, he's OP, isn't he? Yeah. Pretty sure he's Orthodox Presbyterian, yeah. Yeah, um, I would maybe want to do like a more full um, uh, last 2,000 years, uh, maybe a study on how, uh, it would depend on how you, what's that? Okay, yeah, yeah, you'd have to look into it and see if there's anything that can sort of build upon that argument, um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, um, you know, I heard Rosaria Butterfield talk about the uniqueness of the time that we're in. There's some things that are unique about it, yeah. certainly, certainly. Um, there are also unique things about every generation. And um, we, you know, we, we do well to just temper our expectations. And um, I think that it's easy for us to um, make a boogeyman of the cultural moment and, um, you know, government and media and all these kind of things as though they weren't corrupt before. Um, there might have been times in the past when they were, when the corruption was less. I think that's true. Um, it just seems like the pendulum kind of swings. And uh, we do well... I just think that we should, we should protect ourselves, guard ourselves from the madness of the last things. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing, and then Holly, and then Connie. Um, Hebrews one one. In the past, in many days, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son. We do well to think about the last days as all the days since Jesus came. You say, well last days, it's been 2,000 years. Um, but, but the end has already come into the present. The end is going to be final resurrection and final judgment. That's already come in Christ's coming. That's the point of him rising from the dead, and that's the point of him saying, I don't come to judge, my word judges. The idea being that the end has, in one sense, already begun. And there are churches all throughout the world preaching the gospel of reconciliation with God and, in so doing, judging the world. Not that we're trying to be judgmental, but the fact that we tell the truth gives a, a, a culpability to, uh, to whatever context in which we find ourselves. Um, so I just, we do well, and that's not, the only time in he, that's not the only time Hebrews 1 where the end times or the last days is something that is current in the time of the New Testament. Um, we could, we could do a study on that how many times in the New Testament in these last days or in the final days comes up and it's like it must be talking about something that those who are writing and those who are being written to would experience. Know this, Timothy. Um, in the last days, people will be scoffers. People will be this. People will be that. Why does he, like, what does he mean uh, if he doesn't mean this is going to be your experience, Titus and Timothy? Um, you could say he's prophesying things that are going to come way, way, way later. Could. But in context, he's talking to pastors who are younger than him. It seems like he's saying, in the last days in which we find ourselves right now, this is what's going to happen, um, Timothy and Titus. So be ready for that. Be ready for, be ready for hypocrisy. Be ready for fake faith. Um, be ready for love to grow cold. And that applies to us as well. Be ready for that. And maybe it's the actual last days, or maybe we're just in the last days in the same sense that they were. Holly and then Connie. Go ahead. I just want to suggest that when you read the book, you look at it from a cultural, different cultural perspective. So I've always kind of wondered, this is one of my favorite phenomenon, 
Yeah. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Um, he has chosen to, he has chosen to give me life as an American citizen my whole life. Praise God. Um, does that come with its challenges? Yes. Um, do I sometimes wonder what it would be like to live in a different culture? Yeah, I do all the time, actually. But he has called me to seek him where I am. And, um, the hope is, as Paul said there, that they, that they might feel their way towards him and find him. He's not far. That's what Paul says. He's not far from any of us. Interestingly, Paul quotes from a pagan, uh, from a pagan document in the next thing when he says, in him we live and move and have our being. Um, you know, Paul, that's not a scriptural quotation. How could you use that? Did you realize that the church is supposed to only use sacred writings? Well, Paul says, according to him and according to really all of scripture, Anything that is true belongs to God. So it's not off limits to say, you know, uh, I'll, let, me, let me just admit something. And Connie, I'm going to let you talk here in just a second, I promise. Um, I took an enneagram test yesterday, and uh, it's, a, it's a personality type test. And um, it's off limits to most conservative Christians because it seems like it's so worldly and of the world and all those kind of things. And what I found was truth. What it said about me, I'm like, that seems to be pretty accurate, and it seems to be what people tell me about myself as well. So if Proverbs says there's wisdom in the counsel of many, that means that this might be something that could be dangerous, sure. There might also be some truth to it. There might also be some helpful aspects to it. And if something is true, it belongs to God. It's the same thing as Augustine saying there were a lot of things that Plato had right, there were a lot of things that Plato had wrong. The church takes the things that he had right and says, this is true and this is God's truth in the same way that the Israelites took the Egyptian gold on their way out of Egypt and said, this belongs to God and it's going to be used to worship him. Um, so I don't even know why I got off on that little tangent just then, but it happens sometimes. Go ahead, Connie. No, no forgive me. Yeah. What's that? I didn't say, I didn't say, scripture, it's the Spirit's uh, book. Scripture is the Spirit's uh, book, and, um, uh, oh, that's all right, no, no, I thought, I thought maybe I just skipped a word in the, in a sentence, which I, no, I, I very well, I very well might have. Scripture is the Spirit's book understanding as the Spirit's work. Um, so it's when, we, it's when we understand what we're reading and appreciate it um, that we know that the Spirit of God has really, in one sense, done a double work, right? He's inspired the Scriptures and given it to us, and he's, uh, and he's given us illumination. This is, this is a thing. Theologians draw this uh, distinction all the time. Um, Distinction between inspiration and illumination. Let me write the sentence up here. Scripture, Spirit's book, understanding, Spirit's work, and this over here. This is inspiration. This is illumination. So it's not that. So it's not that um, he inspires us to be able to understand these things. He's already inspired. He inspires this. He illuminates us. He gives us clarity on these things. Um, 
And if other people's faith journey is similar to mine, which I'm sure it probably is, um, I think we probably all can attest to this, sometimes your understanding that you thought you had earlier on um, is then replaced by a deeper and better understanding that you have later on so that you look back and say, man, I didn't know anything before. And it's possible that 10 years later you'll look back and say, man, I didn't know anything back then. But that's because the Spirit is continually illuminating us and helping us, giving us clarity on these things and uh, so that we can walk with the Lord, treasure and appreciate and enjoy uh, Him and enjoy this life that He's given us. To feel our way towards, as Holly said, to feel our way towards the Lord, um, that we might find Him. And He's not far from us. Interestingly, um, there's both a present and a future orientation in that sermon in Acts 17, that we would feel our way towards him and find him. He's not far from any of us. In him we live and move and have our being. That's present. And he has set a day, Paul says next, on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and he's given proof of that to all people by raising him from the dead. That's future-oriented. So there's both a present and a, uh, and a future orientation. You might even say he's given proof to all of this by raising him from the dead. That's a past orientation, isn't it? The three sort of spheres of time. We relate to the past, we live in the present, we relate to the future. Um, Christ is supposed to have control uh, in our lives over all that. In that sense, we take every thought captive uh, in obedience to Christ. One more thing, Peter. Absolutely. Um, you know, would it make sense to say that it's generally speaking been roughly the same amount of time from Abraham to Christ coming to now? You know, yeah. So maybe we would expect it to be right around the corner. But with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Um, Don't yeah, yeah, I mean, Peter's, you know, Peter's making the point that uh, we're going to be, we're going to be having people wondering, you know, why is it taking so long for him to come back? But what does he say? He says, he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The idea is he's still, he's still saving people. Um, he wants heaven to be full, and it will be. But apparently, not enough people have come to the Lord yet for heaven to be full yet. So there's still going to be there's going to be more time. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. We got uh, got just about ten minutes or so left. Uh, Jesus then goes into teaching how the church grows, verses thirteen to twenty eight. We might say, um, we might call this explaining true religion. So if he exposes the leaven of religiosity, he then explains true religion in verses 13 and following. Um, now this is going to be the first explicit teaching that Jesus gives about the church. It's the first of two explicit teachings. And just notice also that it follows that challenge, um, of, uh, that challenge to the status quo that he had made before. Um, it follows him saying there are, Basically, they're all about protecting the status quo. And then immediately after that, he then comes to disciples and says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? So the idea is, 
since, since I've been talking about what's normal and what's consensus uh, in society, what is the consensus opinion about me? What do people say about me? What's their opinion about me in verse 13? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And so he says, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, which is son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. There it is again. That's illumination, right? The Spirit's been given a, has given illumination to Peter. And I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, Petros, it's a word that means rock, and uh, he's, he's making Peter uh, into this into this rock-like figure. There's debate about this. As an evangelical Christian, I'm not supposed to say that Peter is the rock, but it, that it's Peter's profession of faith. I, I have not yet found, and I've read a lot um, of cases that Jesus isn't saying that Peter's the rock. I think that he is, but it's Peter's leading the disciples to profess who Christ is that then is the rock. It's the apostolic profession of Christ that Peter is the is the leader of. And that's why Paul can say in Ephesians 2 that it's, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So um, it's going to start with Peter, but it's not about Peter. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, which he's then going to repeat over in chapter 18. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, so what is the consensus? What is the prevailing opinion of me? That's the question. And then he makes the point that it is on the correct profession of Christ that the church will be built and Satan will not be able to stop it. So it seems to me like Jesus is contrasting here what Satan has been allowed to do um, in the world and in the society of the time on one hand, and then on the other hand, how it is that Satan will be bound. What has he been allowed to do? He's been allowed to trick people and confuse people about religiosity and about the times, about what they should pursue, about what, um, like, about, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, things that, like, things that, uh, that, they think, please God, but actually he looks at what's inward. You know, he has been allowed to lead people astray. In fact, Paul says this, that he's blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Satan is the God of this world. People who are spiritually dead, they follow the prince of the power of the air um, in Ephesians 2. He's been allowed to do all of this, and he will continue. Satan is not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He doesn't see the future. Um, he doesn't know he's a created being just like the other angels. But he's an adversary who is very cunning and is allowed to deceive. Jesus says, here's how you bind him through the correct profession of Christ as the Son of God. Um, he, he is subdued, the enemy is, if you preach me, profess me, and get it right. The enemy will be subdued. The gates of hell will not be able to stop it. You can even have so, conf so much confidence in this that whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You're saying, are you, are you suggesting that churches never make mistakes? No, I'm not saying the churches never make mistakes. I'm just saying that despite their mistakes, the church is still going to be healthy regardless of what it does. If Christ is treasured, if he is, if he is being preached and followed and all that. That's why I, can, I said earlier what I said about how, you know, we sometimes have an earlier understanding that we then realize later was pretty off. But then we look back and we say, but the Lord was with me there, even if I didn't see things clearly. And he's with me here as well. And the common denominator is his shepherding me every step of the way. It's not my seeing everything crystal clear. It's not my getting everything right. The common denominator is that Jesus is there every step of the way. Um, and it's in that sense, Satan cannot destroy uh, what the Lord is doing and what the Lord is, 
is, uh, is um, focusing on and uh, putting his attention on. Let me, let me just continue on here quickly. It's first time that he foretells his death. First time that he foretells his death and resurrection. He began to show his disciples in verse 21 uh, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Um, and so Peter takes him aside famously and he begins to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. That is to say, I forbid this. I will never let people uh, take you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You're a stumbling block in Greek. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So Jesus is here making the point that salvation requires the cross. The only way that salvation comes is if the Messiah goes to the cross. And Satan is already trying to stop it. He's subdued by Christ being preached, treasured, and followed. But notice he is already trying to stop this work. This is a, this is a picture of church, isn't it? I can preach Jesus, I can tell you to follow him, but you go out the door, maybe you don't even have to go out the door on a Sunday, and there, the enemy is like already working to try to throw us off. Peter goes from being the rock to being the devil within just a few verses. Um, again, Jesus is with him, and that's the common denominator, and that's why Peter um, didn't, uh, didn't fall away from the Lord. Um, but just notice here, Jesus is saying, here's how the devil can be subdued, but then immediately after that, the devil is, is uh, trying to stop uh, this work. And so, last thing here, verses 24 to 28, uh, well-known verses that we all know, I'm not going to read them all, uh, but if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Um, famous verses in 25 to 26, the Son of Man will come with his angels in glory of his Father, verse 27, and judge. Some standing here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Um, I'm going to pass on commenting on that last verse because there's a lot of uh, discrepancy among believers what Jesus means by that. Um, but I'll just say this. Jesus had just said that I must take up the cross for you to be saved. Peter says, I don't think so. Jesus says, you're following Satan. And then he says, if you want to follow me, you must take up the cross as well. You have to. You'll notice as the outline there says, this is the fourth symbolic teaching just in this chapter, the fourth uh, figurative teaching. The reason I say this is because among evangelicals, oftentimes exegesis, which is the pulling out of Scripture, what, it, what is in it, is oftentimes thought about in terms of we have to find out what the original author meant. There's one meaning that he meant, he meant to convey to his readers. And even Jesus himself um, taught figuratively and in symbols. One of the uh, criticisms of Spurgeon's preaching is that he was spiritualizing all the time, all the time. And people say oh, it's because he didn't have confidence in the literal sense of Scripture. No, he had so much confidence in the literal sense of Scripture that he thought we can take this and develop spiritual lessons out of it that can build the people of God up. Things that are true, things that maybe go beyond just what is the, the plain thing. I just beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and, and, uh, scri and um, Sadducees. They thought he was talking about bread. No, it's figurative. Peter, you're the rock. And they look over at Peter, and he's just become a rock. No, he's not. It's figurative. Peter is Satan. He's not literally Satan. It's figurative. Satan is speaking through him. And now, the fourth symbolic teaching is cross-bearing. Not literally. We're not supposed to just be walking through Walmart with a cross on our back or something like that. Um, you know, going on vacation or something with a massive cross on top of the car. Sir, why do you have a cross on top of your car? Well, officers, because Jesus said to take it up if I'm going to follow him. Um, clearly, it's figurative. It's symbolic. And um, probably, probably should use some more time there to talk about symbolic interpretation. I just would, the reason I bring it up is because Jesus says, have spiritual eyes. Have spiritual eyes. See what is underneath 
um, the things uh, that are in front of you and make sure that you're looking for, for God in it. So now that I've thrown that kind of that figurative exegesis grenade out there, some of you might have might be like, what's the big deal here? Well, read evangelical scholarship and you'll find what the big deal is. Um, they'll say that I sound Catholic right now. And it's like, if you know me well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty Baptist. Um, and, uh, but I just think that there's, you know, when, when Paul says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain from Deuteronomy applies to paying pastors. That's what he says. It's figurative interpretation. He's saying God is more concerned about people than he is about animals. And I just think that we have some liberty as long as we don't move beyond, um, as long as we don't contradict what God's word says. Uh, there, are, there are discernible liberties that we have. There's freedom as long as Christ in the gospel is fencing uh, the liberties that we have. So again, just threw the grenade out there. Any thoughts before we uh, close? Forgive me for rambling today. I've been thinking a lot this past week. Pelos. See that? Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Do you think can be used in any other way? Okay. Yeah, I guess. Other things can be inspired. It's a pretty deep question. Um, it's a good question. I I tend to agree with you. Um, you know, Carl Bart wanted to protect against um, bibliolatry, which is the idolizing of the scriptures as, uh, as being an end to themselves, um, which I understand and which I respect. I don't think that the scriptures are an end to themselves. They're a means to the end of knowing God and knowing the truth. Um, that being said, scripture is entirely unique. And in that sense, I agree with you. It's inspired in a special way. I, I'm not, like when I preach, I'm not inspired. Um, I'm, I'm working for illumination. Uh, I'm, I'm taking what I feel like the Lord has given me via illumination the last few days, preparing a sermon, to hopefully illuminate other people as well. But the only thing that's inspired is what's sitting on the pulpit. My sermon notes, I'm just kidding. Um, the scripture, that's the only thing that's inspired. Um, if something is true, it's God's, and you can find truth in surprising places. That doesn't mean that God inspired it in the same way that he did the scriptures. This is more of like a seminary classroom question, uh, Paul, but that's a, it's a good question, you know, but we have to define our terms like what does it mean? What does inspired and illuminate mean? Good question. Last thing, and then we've got to stop. Oh, yeah, he yeah, kind of yeah. So then, if that's the spirit, then the glory goes to God, but let's say, oh, I'm so glad I got that idea, and you open up the, you know, pride that you're in. Sure. Right yeah, I don't know. I, I guess it, um, the thing is, what's the root word for inspire? Spirit. Yeah. Inspiration. Um, he does. He is inspiring us, um, but, but what he's doing, if, if we're ever walking in the truth in an inspired way, it's because of, it's because of what he has said here. Um, so it kind of comes down to semantics, I, I suppose, but I'm, I'm, inclined to, I'm inclined to walk with a more sure footing probably of what you said, Paul, that scripture is inspired and then the spirit is able to take what's inspired and 
help us to walk in it, to walk by the Spirit, right? Romans 8, keep in step with the Spirit, all of that in Galatians 5. I'm sorry, Peter, we got to stop, it's late. Um, yeah, hold on, remember that for next week. I'm just kidding. Uh, we gotta, we got to stop, we got to pray. So Father, thank you for not only your inspiration of the Scriptures, but for your illumination, uh, taking the Scriptures, giving us understanding. And this is all, it's all the work of the Spirit. Uh, so may we walk by the Spirit, keep in step with Him. And I pray that as we go into worship in the coming minutes, that you would prepare our hearts for what you have for us. May we trust the Lord and uh, walk by faith in Him. May Christ be treasured, and uh, may God be worshipped and adored as He is. Keep us in step uh, with the Spirit. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.